We want to continue with our video on tools, and there are several different varieties here. Mr. Tallfeather, what can you tell us about these Indian tools here? Well, let's start over here on this side uh, with these billets. This billet is made out of deer antler. As you can see, the ends are very well worked, very well rounded off uh, from use. Of course, in the use of a billet was in making uh, arrowheads. Also, some flint axes we'll look at here in just a minute. But they would take this billet and hit down on a piece of flint like this to, to break it off into little, you know, little flakes off of it and to make their major form. And then they would take an antler flaker or bone flaker and usually use antler because it is a much harder uh, than bone and then come back and make their secondary flakes uh, using it this way to make their secondary flakes to sharpen off the edges and thin them on down. And here we have a couple of examples of some, some bone awls. Again, they were used to perforate leather, even use them as pins to hold their clothing together. This is a conch shell, and as you can see, uh, they've cut off and broke off all the pieces except, except for the middle part of the body of the conch shell. Uh, the top of it is rather rough where they have broken and cutting it off, but the end of it, I believe they used to have used this for some kind of a digging tool because it is very smooth. You can see a lot of wear uh, where they have used this as uh, some, maybe a, some kind of a digging tool. Or And then also we have so, uh, several examples of some axes. Uh, this is a limestone hoe. Uh, didn't really use this as an axe. You can see uh, that it doesn't have a sharp blade. It's very polished from digging, uh, more than likely digging in the ground, either used for digging graves or for in their farming purposes. And you can also see what's called peck marks on this stone, these little white marks, where they would take a harder stone and, and knock off little pieces of it and then grind it back down to the shape that they want it. This piece is very smooth on all corners, all sides. Of course, the bit end is very, very polished. And also have a, a greenstone axe, a full grooved axe. Uh, this is a flint chopper. Uh, probably use that to burst bone. Uh, they, the Indians like to didn't like to waste anything. You'd have a large bison bone or deer bone. They would break those bones up to eat the marrow. Of course, the marrow had a lot of good high protein and iron. And these are just some examples of some smaller uh, flint celts, flint axes. Uh, use them just like they would the greenstone axes. They would haft them uh, on a wooden handle. Uh, and use them just like we would an axe. This, of course, is a, a greenstone celt. And another greenstone celt. This one here looks like it had been broken in the past. Probably was a much larger celt, but they broke it and really worked it down. It's, a, it's not got a fine edge. Uh, as you can see, it's, it's been broken and probably worked down and, and got a sharp edge on it here. Now this one that's got the curved edge is just a little different. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, this is a, a flint gouge. Uh, as you can see, the point is not straight across. Uh, the, the bit end of this is in a curvature. Uh, they would make gouges uh, when they were making their wooden mortars. Uh, also in digging out their canoes, they would take a log and burn that log. And, and then as they uh, burned it, they would take and chop out the the, the ash or the, what was burnt, and then they would burn it again, and they would chop all that ash out again until they got their dugout the shape that they wanted it. Now you mentioned that the curved edge would nat naturally make a curve as you chop with it, correct? Yes, exactly, exactly. Like I say, you can tell the difference between this curved edge and then the straight edge uh, on this cell. Uh, totally di two different purposes uh, for these. We'd also like to show you an example of uh, a fake axe. Uh, a lot of times when you go to uh, arrowhead shows and uh, to sales, uh, yard sales and uh, flea markets, you'll see some really fine worked axes and you think, well, you've really found a, a find of a lifetime and a lot of times they'll be uh, very inexpensive and that kind of gets your eye too. But if you notice with these axes how smooth, almost glass-like, uh, the Indians didn't have uh, machinery to polish these down with. They used again the peck and grind method. As you can see on this axe, all the little white marks where they pecked it out. Also uh, on this celt right here, again you can see a big difference in how these two are made. How this one has the peck and grind marks. It's very dull in appearance. It has what we call patina. Anytime even rock will oxidize. 
And so when it's exposed to the air and to uh, acidic conditions in the soil, it will make a, what we call patina. It will change the color of the outside of this rock. If you were to break this rock, that this uh, double bitted axe, and that's another clue, the Indians never made a double bitted axe that I've ever seen or heard about. But if you were to break this piece, it would look the same at the break as it does on the outside because there's no oxidation, no patina on this axe. Same thing is true with this one. A very highly polished stone. And again, you can see this is not even a native stone uh, to the southeast or the, the Midwest or any other place that I've ever, I've never seen a, a stone like this, uh, any artifact in our area made from this. So be very careful when you're buying your axes. Look for the peck and grind marks. Look for patina. Uh, and also, if it's too perfect and too good to be true, then it probably is. Well, thank you, Mr. Tuffett.